If you would turn with me in your Bibles, turn to John 17. John 17. John 17, powerful verse of scripture. This is Jesus praying. And the good thing I love about this is we get to overhear Jesus praying for us. Right? A lot of prayers going on right now. Right? You hear about what's happening. How, y'all, how many of y'all are aware of what the pastor was talking about with Asbury? Power God breaks out there. Interesting little tidbit about that. It was during a black history celebration at Asbury that that happened. And uh, one of the young people got up in the middle of that and just started confessing their own sins around something. And the presence of God began to fall. Now, the omnipresence of God is one thing. Right? But when the manifest presence of God, when the glory of God falls... It's a couple different words for glory. One is Shekinah in Hebrew, but there's another one called Kabod. That's when the weighty presence of God is. The weighty presence of God fell in the room. And there's one African-American young man named George who was there and said, you know, maybe we should stay around for a little bit, for a little bit longer. And then about three weeks later, they were still there. <laughs> and the rest of the world found out about it. Conservative estimates, 50,000 people showed up. Some say about 100,000 people showed up. But the interesting thing about Asbury and what's going on there, Francis Asbury was a circuit rider. He was over the circuit riders and he was a revivalist and an abolitionist, took a strong stand, one for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then also, too, he took a strong stand against slavery. He had all of his circuit riders, these men who were these Methodist uh, traveling ministers who went horseback across the country preaching the gospel, they carried a couple of things in their satchels. They carried Bibles, hymnals, and, and manumission forms. The manumission forms were so that if they preached the gospel and a slave owner got saved, they would slide it over to them and say, hey, you know, it was for freedom that Christ set us all free, so go ahead and sign these documents and set your slaves free too. That's the history of this man. And everywhere they went, Matt will talk about that more. I don't, I don't want to steal your thunder, but that's... <laughs> because he had circuit riders in his family too. He'll, we'll talk about all that stuff in a deeper way, but that's what I'm saying. Something's going on. I think there's a signal that God sends through that school, Asbury, because it's not so much that God likes Wilmer, Wilmer Kentucky as much as he loves his friends. And what revival is, revival is when God's heart erupts open and is poured out on a life that is sacrificed before him. And he'll visit a place over and over and over again because he still remembers that person's devotion to him. No greater love. Anyone is this that you lay down their lives for his friends. And when you lay down your life for Jesus, he'll go visit your offspring. Everybody talks about generational curses. They go three and four generations, sometimes ten. But generational blessings go to a thousand generations. That means basically forever. So there's outpourings over and over again what happened through Asbury, 1905, and then Azusa Street is happening around the same time. And then 1950, the healing revivals happen around the same time. The latter rain move in 1993, and again, outpouring at Brownsville, where Pastor came out of that revival in, you know, 1970. Then now, this one here, something's going on, right? And then we have uh, Baylor University, other places. And there was a man who traveled with Francis Asbury named Harry Hoosier. Couldn't read or write. But the interesting thing about Hoosier, though he couldn't read and write, he traveled with Francis Asbury as his intercessor, as his co-labor in Christ. And as they traveled across the country together, uh, preaching, Harry would pray. But one day, now he wasn't his slave, he was his friend in Christ, and they traveled together. <clears throat> one day, Asbury couldn't preach, so they said, um, Asbury said, Harry, you need to preach tonight. I can't, I can't. I can't go to the meeting. So Harry preached and revival broke out. Not just there, but several other places. He preached to mostly white crowds, mixed crowds, all around the country. Benjamin Rush said that Harry Hoosier was the most eloquent orator of his day. And he would preach sometimes and sometimes the denominational folks and some of the uh, other institutions that were still, you know, racist. They would, they would make fun of people who got saved in his gatherings. And they would call them Hoosiers. So he was preaching in Indiana once, and all the folks in Indiana who were pastors and leaders, all those folks are just Hoosiers. This is part of his fan club. You ever wonder why, how Indiana became known as the Hoosier State? It was because of the preaching of Harry Hoosier. 
And there's some people who are, you know, poking their fingers at Asbury and some of the things that are going on. But I think God is saying this. If you'll pray for Asbury, maybe you'll become a voice like Hoosier. Can we stand just a moment? Can we pray for just a little bit? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing with young people right now. Lord, what's happening on all of our college campuses. And Lord, while the ark is on the move, we're not going to touch it. We're not going to speak against it. We're not going to criticize what you're doing. Lord, at Asbury or anywhere else, but God, what we're saying right now is fan the flame, Jesus. We ask for revival fire to spread all over our country. God, I'm asking you to visit, visit Houston University in the name of Jesus. Visit Lamar University in the name of Jesus. God, we ask you to visit College Station. God, would you go and break out in Texas A&M in the name of Jesus. God, would you visit, Lord, uh, every historically black college and university in the name of Jesus. God, we ask you for an outbreak of the Holy Spirit all over this nation, God, for a generation that's so brokenhearted and struggling with identity issues. God, we're asking you for an outbreak like we've never seen before so that generations even yet to be created can praise you. So today, God, we ask you to come. Would you remember the sacrifice of our forefathers? Would you let your heart be moved that we remind you of the people who have moved your heart, who prayed under kettle pots and who traveled horseback all across this country, sacrificing unto you. Give us the grace to respond to your voice in this hour so that generations even yet to be created can praise you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, thank you, Sean, man. I wasn't planning on starting off like this, but we're here now, so we might as well praise him. John 17, I love this scripture because we get to overhear Jesus praying for us. John 17, look at verse uh, 20. He says, neither... Pray I for these alone, talking about the 12 disciples, but for them also who believe in me through their word. Turn to your neighbor and say, now he's praying for you. What is he praying? That they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and loved them even as thou hast loved me. Powerful, powerful words. You know what I love about this scripture? This is Jesus praying. We get to over here and praying. And the beautiful thing about it, how many, how many, I mean, God, how many prayers does Jesus answer for you? One, salvation, provision, other things. Hasn't he been good to you? Has he been good to your family? Yes. This is our opportunity to answer one of his prayers. We get to answer his prayer by uniting the body of Christ. And there's something so profound about it that a lost and dying world will look at our love and our unity and they'll say, what must I do to be part of a family like that? Maybe this is the place where I get that rejection thing broken off my life. What must I do to be saved? They're powerful. And so I think we're in this season of answered prayer. And the Father's going to answer the Son's prayer. And we get to partner with him in that right now. Because listen, God's going to use a united church to heal a divided nation. Amen. And for me, it starts with the story of this pot. But this pot is, I believe, also connected to this powerful speech of Dr. King. We're going to, I'll talk more deeply about that. But I just want to give you like a, a brief survey of our story. And then we're going to turn this into a prayer meeting. Is that okay? All right. If y'all would, go ahead and cue up that I Have a Dream speech for me. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. Powerful, powerful speech, right? Amen. 
love that speech because I'm one of those sons of former slaves. And this kettle pot actually came from the slaves in my family. Passed down many generations. You know, it's not a mistake the family you're born into. You're not just some accident that happened. God willed you into existence. And there's a redemptive purpose for, for the family which you were born into, the area where you live in, all that. God planned it all out. I say that because I found out that this kettle pot came from Lake Providence, Louisiana. Providence is the continuous activity of God by which he preserves and governs. It's the way God looks over seemingly insignificant things and apparent accidents. In other words, you had no idea how many things God pre prevented from happening for you to get here. And most of your own time. <laughs> you had no idea how many things you thought were just accidents and just happened to meet that person at the right time. And you got that job, that promotion, or that breakthrough. No. God watches over it all. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew language, there's no word for coincidence. They believe that God watches over it all. Right? And he's done that in our nation over and over again. The hand of providence, everybody talks about, everybody's favorite little word right now is narrative. Listen, there's a meta-narrative. There is a God storyline for your life. There's a God storyline for this nation, and he's being wiped out of it, to be honest. You know? And so people talk about critical race theory, and I understand, you know, their thoughts around that. What about critical grace theory? What about understanding how the hand of God has moved in our nation in the midst of all of our mistakes, and we're not anywhere where we need to be, but we're not where we used to be at all. He's healed us big time. So what you're going to hear in this story is this crazy providential hand of God. How he's been working in my life and Matt's life and has woven into the fabric what God's been doing through Christian founders in this nation, Christian believers who are praying, who are even enslaved, and others who fought for their freedom, who were revivalists and abolitionists. I mean. So the best way to understand providence in the New Testament is Ephesians 2 and 10 where it says we're God's workmanship. In Christ Jesus, and we're walking out the works that he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. The word workmanship, y'all, is a powerful word. It's the word poema. Everybody say poema. So here's the word poem in there, right? So think about it. You're God's poem. You're his song. But even greater than that, the word poema was a word that was used to describe someone as a skillful tailor, weaver, and fabric maker. In other words, God has a tailor-made plan, tailor-made destiny for all of our lives, and he's Weaving something together connected to the family you're born into, the community you live in, the nation you're a part of. God's weaving it all together, right? Now, my sister, she used to do crochet and needlepoint. She used to weave stuff together. And she'd be working on something for forever sometimes. And I'd be looking at her doing that like, why would somebody work on something that ugly for so long? You know, because all I saw was just knots and tatters and everything. And she said, no, 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 let me turn it around so you can see what I'm working on. And she would turn it around and go, oh, now I see what you're working on. Listen, that's what God is doing with this little story. We've seen a bunch of knots and tatters from COVID. <laughs> Saw a bunch of knots and tatters with things we couldn't understand with all the stuff that happened with the pandemic and the shutdowns and the quarantines. Lots of knots and tatters. A lot of pain in offering too. But can I turn this around for you so you can see what God's been working on for a little while? Yeah, it's not just my story, it's your story too. You're woven into this whole thing. So I hadn't thought much about this pot till I uh, heard somebody talking about this concept of prayer called synergy. What is synergy? Synergy is when you take two separate things and you connect them together. They don't create an addition of power, but a multiplicity of power. Like scientists say, if you take two horses and put them together, it creates so much exponential power, it's as if a third invisible horse has been added. But spiritually, we know that one could put a thousand of light in Two could put 10,000 to flight. That's synergy. So think about it. We start getting all this agreement in prayer between red, yellow, black, and white. <laughs> Old, young, male, and female. We can see the synergistic exponential release in the power of prayer like we've never seen before. Right? So I understood that part. But then he said something that was so profound and it messed me up. He said, not only can you agree in prayer with a person sitting next to you, you can also agree in prayer with a generation behind you. He was talking, this is Dutch, he's talking, he said he was at Christ for the Nation, his alma mater, leading the student body there in prayer. And while he's leading them in prayer, the Lord says, I want you to come in agreement with the prayers of the founder of this school. And Dutch thought, okay, okay, God, that man's dead. He's been dead for a really long time. And I know you're not into talking to the dead. And the Holy Spirit said, I didn't say agree with him, I said agree with his prayers. His prayers are still alive before my throne. 
And there are things I promised this man in prayer that I want to release into this school right now, but I can't do it yet. I need this generation to come in agreement with that generation. I want to release the synergy of the ages. In other words, there's a baton from the past for revival and awakening that's going to bring healing to our nation. But the, but the previous generation is looking for somebody to take baton today or take the mantle today. And if Elijah goes up and the mantle comes down, if Elisha doesn't grab it, that mantle is going to keep drifting in the wind. I refuse to let a mantle for revival drift in the wind to the next generation. We're going to seize that thing right now. And finally, while he was talking, the scripture made sense to me where it says, leave Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. All these by faith, talking about the great heroes of faith, said they were approved for their faith, but they did not receive what was promised so that apart from us that we may perfect without us. In other words, there's this whole company of people, y'all, looking over the balcony of heaven saying, don't mess this thing up. God started something in us that he wants to complete exponentially through you. Jesus said it best when he said, what, greater works than these are you going to do because I'm going to the Father, and they'll start something in one generation and complete it exponentially through future generations. Well, when he said that, I remember this part, and I remember why it was passed down to my family. It's used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They use it for washing clothes, but they pass it down because secretly they use it in their prayer meetings. So they're owned by a slave master at that time period who would beat them for any reason. Praying was one of them. Um, see, back then they wanted slaves to be Christians because they knew the Christian slaves made better workers, but they would pervert the gospel and say, slaves be obedient to your masters if you want to go to heaven. Now, we know we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. It's a gift of God so that so no one should boast. But it was easy to teach slaves that back then because it was against the law for slaves to read and write. It was also against the law for anybody to teach them how to read and write. And the irony is that they didn't want them to pray because they felt like if they prayed, it would foster hope. And if they got hopeful, they felt like these folks would try to run away. So they would literally be beaten if they were caught praying. We had somebody in the family literally beat to death just for going fishing without asking. So that's how cruel slavery was on that plantation. And if they were caught praying, they would be beaten as well. But listen, the folks who passed down this pot in my family, they were Christians, and they decided to pray anyway. So what they would do is they would go into a barn late at night to make sure their prayer meeting wasn't seen. But to make sure it wasn't hurt, they used this pot. So they would take the pot, and this is the pot they used. They would take it and turn it upside down in the cabin floor, prop it up with rocks so it would be suspended off the ground about an inch or two, like three or four rocks. They would then prostrate themselves in the ground and put their lips in between the opening between the ground and the kettle so that this kettle popped muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story they passed down with the pot is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time. So they prayed for the freedom of their children in the next generation. One day freedom comes, this young teenage girl decides to keep this pot and that story in our family. Now, why would she do that? She's probably thinking about all those who are dead and gone risk their lives to pray for her. She's probably thought about all those who are too old to enjoy the freedom she's about to embrace. So she keeps this pot and this story in our family, and she passed the pot and the story down to Harriet Lockett. Harriet Lockett passed it on to Nora Lockett. Nora Lockett passed it on her son, William Ford Sr., who then passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. So I'm there at this prayer gathering, Hearing this man talking about agreeing with the prayers and taking the baton from the past to keep the chain of intercession going, I thought, oh, my God, I get to agree with the prayers of my forefathers. In my family and the Christian forefathers in this nation, I get to agree with the prayers of my forefathers for the freedom of this next generation. And I thought about the exponential results that could be released and created, created from that. Shared it with Dutch, and we started talking about doing this prayer journey around the country called the Kettle Tour to remind people of the prayer bowls. Listen, this pot caught muffled prayers on earth, but literally, Revelation 5 and 8 says they're golden bowls in heaven, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Every time you pray, it's caught in heaven by God, not in a wooden bowl, but a golden bowl. You know why? Because that's how precious your prayers are to God. Listen, y'all, there's a prayer bowl over Beaumont. There's a prayer bowl over your family. There's a prayer bowl over this nation. God's looking for a new generation to resource the prayer bowls once again. So Dustin was praying. He said, God, you want me to have some cash down cooking pot represent the prayer bowls in heaven? I need confirmation. So he 
said he, he was with his friend Lou Engle, and his Bible fell open to Zechariah 14 and 20. Part B of that verse says, and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord shall be like the bowls before the altar. So here's this cooking pot that's caught muffled prayers saying there's a bowl in heaven that catches our prayers like incense. And Dutch said this to him. He said, William, wouldn't it be just like God in his justice and irony to use the prayers of a slave generation to free a nation up for, revi for revival again? I'm glad he said generation because it wasn't just black Christian slaves praying back then. Like I said, it were white Christian abolitionists and revivalists like Asbury and others who know that if any person was a slave was a Christian, they knew that person was their brother. They laid their lives down for each other. Many of them had their houses burned. They were shot. They were even killed and lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than compromise and wink at slavery. And it helped me understand something. See, those people put their privilege at risk to see other people flourish because they knew that the Christian enslaved person was their family member. They were fighting for family. And I realized, oh my God, my ancestors have been Muslims or Buddhists. I'd had no connection to the part of his history, but because they were Christians, listen, not only these, my ancestors and forefathers, if you're a believer, these were part of your family. This was part of your family history too. In other words, I'm just as much a spiritual son of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as you are Martin Luther King and William Seymour and C.H. Mason and all. We're all connected to all that, y'all. When we come together in that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, something powerful happens. Amen. And so, but the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, William, if you want to be a part of this, you got to deal with your own baggage. <laughs> and so he addressed that through this dream that he gave me about the dream of Martin Luther King. I'm going to share, uh, share the dream. Uh, well, I'll share it right now, too. We'll talk about it tonight. But there's a whole lot more we're going to go into later with this because I've, I've combed to, through over 3,000 slave narratives on, on record with the Library of Congress. I found 400 times where other slaves talked about how they had to have secret prayer meetings. Half those times they used wash pots, barrels, and kettles like this one to muffle their voices. We'll go deeper into that tonight. We'll go into a lot of the other history. But the Lord dealt with me about my unforgiveness issues. Through this dream that he gave me about the dream of Dr. King, in the dream, I was on my way to Dr. King's old church with my friend Lou Engle, and uh, the Lord said to me, well, in the dream, Lou Engle is driving, and we were talking, and we have to go pick up Dr. King. <laughs> so it's a dream. So Dr. King is alive, which is weird. But in the dream, he comes out of this house, and he has this humongous white duffel bag with black handles on it in the dream. And he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag, throws the bag down violently, and he comes to get into this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, you know, that, that bag would make a nice souvenir. Which shows you how petty I am, right? I, like, even in my dreams, I'm petty. <laughs> I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse College. He went to Morehouse College. The bag will make a nice souvenir. So that's what I thought. So in the dream, I go to try to pick up the baggage. But before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders. And he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the racial divide in our nation. I wake up from the dream in tears. I've been weeping in intercession the whole night and didn't realize it. My pillow was soaked with tears. Shared the dream with my friend Lou Engle. He begins to weep. We start praying, God, what is the interpretation for this dream? It's like, God, remind me, what did Dr. King say to me? And the Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black candles. That would be the interpretation for your dream. I realized that the black candles represented my ethnicity as an African-American man. And the white baggage represented all of my unforgiveness issues. In other words, God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. And I knew what God was talking about because I experienced some things growing up. Uh, when I was 13 years old and 19 years old and different times in my life, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Being chased, called the N-word by a of full of white guys. I knew what God was talking about. But now I understood why he was telling me to get rid of my baggage. See, the devil, what he loves to do, because for everybody in that region where I live, I put those stories on everybody. Before I had one conversation with anybody, white people, police officers, I put the bad experiences I had with any, any people like that. 
those three experiences, I put them on everybody. It's Revelation 12 where it says the devil is what? The accuser of the brethren. Y'all, that word accuser comes from this powerful Greek word. It's the Greek word kategoros. So we get the word category. In other words, the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize or stereotype each other. So before we have one conversation with each other, we put some bad situation, some bad stigma, some bad narrative, some bad story. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of your unforgiveness. Get rid of your resentment. Get rid of your white baggage. So you can get into a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. And I think the question God has for all of us right now is this. What color is your baggage? Is it red, yellow, black, white, or brown? Or is it a donkey or an elephant? <laughs> yeah, like with all the, from all the stuff we saw from my four years or three, two or three years ago with all the 410 cities that were set on fire by the extreme left and all the stuff we saw on January 6th from the extreme right. Listen, y'all, left wing, right wing, the whole bird is sick. We need the dove back in America. <laughs> it's important that you vote. You vote. Vote biblical values. Do that. But it's also very important how we represent the one we live for. Because God's going to use the United Church to heal a divided nation. Amen. And so it's interesting. Asbury during that time period takes a strong stand against the injustice of his day which was slavery and the shed against the blood. God is still looking for people to stand up against the injustice of our day, the shedding against the blood of the child in the womb. Because it's all connected to the race issue. I and mean, we can talk about eugenics and all that stuff. I don't have time to go into it. But the deal is this. When the people that you cannot see can become optional, it's inevitable that other people that we can see can also be dehumanized and marginalized even to the place of elimination. So I began to see that the litmus test for authentic revival in my day will be the changing of the human heart in that regard. To see dignity coming to the child and the womb in a profound way. So my friend Lou Engel said, hey, let's do this prayer meeting at the Lincoln Memorial, MLK Celebration Day 2005. I agreed to do that. And had this big book with me from, called the Testament of Hope. It fell open to the I Have a Dream speech. And I started reading it like a prayer from Dr. King's pulpit. But I get to the part where it says, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves, sons of former slave owners, would sit together at the table of brotherhood. And for the first time, I thought, whatever happened to that family that owned my family, where this pot came from? Well, little did I know, Mr. Poema, God was bringing me into some more unfinished business. I want to bring up my good friend, Matt Lockett. Matt... <laughs> One of the most faithful prayer warriors that I know. And the guy's a general, he's a general in the body of Christ. Please welcome my friend Matt Lockett. Good morning. So something you need to understand is that Will and I have told this story quite a bit for the last few years. And uh, there's a certain way that we tell the story. And uh, we've, we've always had this prayer that we've, you know, we've allowed to try to govern the way that we tell the story because we want, we want the story to connect, but we want the Lord to, we want to make a landing strip for the Holy Spirit to come. And so Will got up this morning and he went way off script. <laughs> so can we just invite the Holy Spirit right now? Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we ask you, in this conspicuous moment in time right now, where we look and everywhere we look, we see you're doing something very unique in our day. God, I pray that you would deliver us from cynicism right now, that you would deliver us from skepticism and you would deliver us from apathy, that we would be willing and ready to step into what you are doing in America right now, in Jesus' name, amen. So because we have an opportunity to reel you guys back in for tonight. We're, we're kind of saving the, the big story for this evening. Will you come back tonight, please? There's so much that needs to be said. But uh, would you turn with me real quick to Job chapter 14? Job chapter 14. You know, Will brought up the subject of Asbury. 
And I've done a lot of study on the man Francis Asbury. He is the father of the Methodist movement in the New World. And so he came here as a British missionary to the colonies. And then when the Revolutionary War broke out, all the ministers from England left. He was the only one that stayed, praise God. And he became the, the father of the Methodist circuit riders that established, uh, helped establish the church in the New World and into uh, the very beginning. It's in, he's in, honored as one of the founding forefathers in the bedrock of the United States, on par with those who signed the Constitution. Did you know that? He, he is regarded at that level of being that influential of a man and, and that influential of a life. But I've read through his journals, and, he, and as he traveled through the colonies at that time, he began to see the great abuse of slavery that had already taken root in the new world. But he saw a group of people known as the Quakers. You've heard of the Quakers who were taking an uncompromising stand against slavery and preaching God's word, uh, what God has to, God's thoughts on the subject of slavery. And Asbury saw it and he said, I believe, he said, I've, I've seen what the Quakers are doing and I believe that the Methodists must come up to this position or I fear that God will depart from us. And so he sets in the very foundational level of what God was doing in this nation, a resistance to evil. And, and, and I'm so provoked by that because I think that even in our day and age, right now and this time, what do we see that we know what is right and wrong, but we turned a blind eye to and we walk past it and we wink at sin. And I believe God is calling his church right now to take a stand lest he depart from us. See, I come to it with a different kind of attitude that it's not just a matter of like, well, you know, I'm for this or I'm against that. No, there is a standard that God is setting for this nation that he is holding us accountable to and we dare not stand against it lest he depart from us. Job chapter 14, verse seven. For there is hope for a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots Grow old in the earth and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. I, I, I believe we are in a moment right now when I'm looking out and I'm seeing the revival. And I will ask a moment ago for a show of hands if you know about what's happening with revival. I saw some hands go up, but maybe you're unaware of what's happening. Something different is happening right now. And if that is true, then we ought not come to church like we always have and expect the same results. Something different is happening. And there's a whole lot of opinion about what it is. I don't know. I don't want to try to get a beat on it. I just want to be a part of it because God's in it. That's why I pray God deliver us from cynicism. Oh, God has nothing to say to the cynical man. Something different is happening right now. And praise God, he's coming to this generation. This is what they're saying. You know, Everybody's got an opinion of what revival should look like. I'll tell you what this one looks like. The, those that have been to Asbury and the other places that are experiencing this, they're saying that it is just this precious, kind, gentle, peaceful, abiding spirit where the, the young people are coming in and worshiping. And I want to tell you this, that is tailor-made for Gen Z. A generation that is, that is shaking under the weight of anxiety and fear. And now God has sent a revival that is tailor-made for this young generation. He's so good. So good. And you hear the kids talking about it. 
and they're saying, we are taking Christianity in our own generation. It's not just coming to church because mom and dad told me anymore. Now this is our faith. This is our Bible, and he is our Savior. Something different is happening right now. Do you know this? It's, I just, we, <laughs> come on, Will. It's like, I'm not saying like, this hasn't been going on for months. This has been going on the last three weeks. And then they just, on a Thursday night, it was the collegiate day of prayer, annual collegiate day of prayer. But this was the 200th anniversary of the collegiate day of prayer. And months and months and months ago, they said, where will we host the main broadcast? And it was decided, let's go to Asbury in Kentucky. That decision was made months ago. The Holy Spirit rolls in three weeks ago and this prayer meeting that happened on Thursday night went around the globe. I heard an S, now listen to these numbers. In the last three weeks, Will said 50,000. I've heard that between 100 to 150,000 people have come to Asbury in the last three weeks. But the broadcast of the prayer meeting Thursday night reached 130 million people around the globe. And you know how you know it's revival? Because nobody on the platform got introduced. Everybody that got on the platform introduced Jesus. Let that be the defining mark on revival in this moment right now, that it's not about who's on the platform if Jesus is nowhere to be found. <laughs> and during worship this morning, I leaned over to Will. And I, it just hit me all of a sudden as we were taking communion. This is the first time we've gotten out the kettle and the first time we've gotten together to share the story of what God is doing in our lives since the revival started. It's different because for years, for 18 years, I've prayed with this man. God sent revival to America. Contended in every corner of this nation and around the globe. God, will you not come in revival like we've seen in the past? But now it's different because I believe now he has sent revival. And so I want to expect different results. Come on, pastor. I don't want to just keep coming to church because I know it's the right thing to do. You know what I mean. God, deliver us from that cynical spirit that would say it's always going to be the way it always has been. What if God is doing something different right now and he's answering the prayers that we've been asking him to answer for decades and instead of just forever waiting for a prayer that we have no hope that, that it would ever be answered, what if he's answering them right now? All I know is I stood in front of that Supreme Court for 18 years and asked God to overturn Roe v. Wade and send the revival to America and June 24th of last year, he answered that prayer. And the covenant with death on this nation was annulled. I believe there's work to be done, but the curse is broken. The devil's foothold in America has been shattered. In a moment at 10, 10 a.m. on June 24th, I was standing there. But I said, God, what about the other part of the prayer? End abortion, send revival. Where's the revival, God. I think it's here. Can you stand with me for just a moment? I want to pray. This isn't what we planned to share with you this morning, but God, God, I believe you're answering prayers. What an honor. What a privilege that we would get to see it with our own eyes. God, prayer bowls in heaven reaching their capacity that the only result is to begin to tip it over. God and prayers are being answered in the earth, causing lightning and thunder and shakings. In our culture, God, in this nation, God, you're coming to a young generation that was hopeless. God, racked with fear and anxiety. 
No answer in sight, but you're coming. Oh, you're coming in kindness. You're coming in mercy. You're coming in a gentle breeze. You're coming and dispelling fears. You're delivering a young generation out of that bondage of anxiety, self-hurt, self-inflicted pain. You're coming and you're healing their hearts. Oh God, we want a revival where we see bodies get healed and diseases get healed. But God, you're coming at a generational level and you're healing the heart of a generation. God, you're reversing the damage of the last three years, God, of a nation just bound up, unable to move, unable to connect. And a generation that's wearing the wounds of that time, God. But Lord, you, you've taken your, paw, your finger off the pause button. Yeah, the Lord's taking his finger off of the pause button and he's now releasing all that is in his heart. I believe this revival is going to touch every college campus in America. It's going to spread. I was in Colorado last week and it was there. We, we couldn't start the meeting. The meeting started itself. I was texting my team back in Washington, D.C., the revival's here. And they said, we don't care. The revival's here. You're missing it. They're caught up. It's there. The meeting went on four hours. My own children at the altar. It's everywhere. It's at Baylor. Come on. Here's the thing. Now we can't stop it. Now we dare not stop it. There's hope for a tree. I think we've been looking out at this nation. We've looked at this young generation. We've said it's, there's nothing left but a dead stump in the ground. There is no hope. But the word of God says, at the scent of water, new shoots will spring forth and the new shoots will not fail. What if we're in that moment right now? This is the scent of water. This is the scent right now. We're starting to hear the rumors. It's here. The revival's there. It's over there. There's a scent of water. I believe that the stump of the church in America is about to send forth new shoots. And I'm absolutely convinced what Francis Asbury saw at the beginning, that one of the biggest things that's going to happen resulting from this revival is he's going to make us one. We get to be, see, we always want Jesus to answer our prayer. Right now, we have an opportunity to answer his prayer. Father, I pray that they would be one, even as you and I are one. We pray that right now. Make us an answer. God, make us an answer to the prayer of your son. That even in this revival, you would come and visit the stump of America. Oh, that you would send fresh water again. And that these new shoots that spring forth. God, I thank you for the roots that you've given us that have gone down deep. We draw from the life in those roots right now. Patriarchs of faith. We draw from the roots right now. God, this, this where we are now was not your dream for America. So God, we prophesy to the stump. Would you lift your voice with me right now? We prophesy to the stump in this nation. And we say, send forth the new shoots of revival and healing. Send forth the new shoots that will not fail. That heal the racial divide in America. The answer to the prayer that we would be one. God, make us one in the United States. That we would be a beacon of hope for the entire globe, God. That we, you would put on display what it looks like for the deepest wounds to be healed. And the deepest level of forgiveness to be released. Glorify your son, Jesus. Who hung on that cross. And with what little breath he had in his lungs, he still was able to mutter out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. God, we want to step into that, that right now, in this moment, right now, that there would not be an, a, a finger of accusation in this place. And God, I pray for this house, that it would be a lampstand, that light would break forth in dark places from this house. 
that there would not be a wagging finger of accusation found among us, but only a, God, what, with what little breath we have, we would say, oh, I forgive, I forgive. Father, forgive that one that hurt me. They didn't know what they were doing. I refuse to hang on to the offense. I think that what God is doing, even with the story that Will and I share, is not just to to deal with our own personal offenses, but I believe that there is an unmistakable lineage, a connecting of historical dots that God wants to reveal to us that show us how we got to where we are, where we came from, what went right, what went wrong, and where we are right now. And God needs to, us to connect these dots in our spirits because he's the God who wants to heal history. Yeah, we look at the nation, we can see things that are good and we see things certainly that, are, that were wrong. But I think that God is releasing this, this weak cry of forgiveness in this generation right now, that even the wrongs of the past, what if oil starts flowing? What, what, if, what if there's fresh water that begins to flow into, you know, to the stump where things were cut, chopped down? You know what I'm saying? That maybe, we'll, maybe we'll get an individual healing, but what if we get a generational healing? What if we actually can see blessings that are dammed up in our past by curses suddenly break loose into the nation? That's what I mean by healing history, that there's, he's the God of generational blessing far more than generational curses. Curses go to three and four generations. Blessings are to a thousand generations. And when there's something that enters in, a blessing gets stopped up in our past. What are you supposed to do with that? There's blessings back there that are for us. What a weird thought. There are blessings in our past that are for us that have not been permitted to flow. What if just a release of forgiveness right now? What if we walk backwards and cover the nakedness of our fathers and we release forgiveness for old curses that entered in? What if the blessings then begin to flow to a thousand generations? Will, would you come up and help me? Help. So Matt and I meet at this prayer meeting in Washington, D.C. Been friends for 18 years, 10 years ago, that he found out that the Civil War ended in his family's front yard. So we thought, man, what a cool coincidence. I got this kettle pot with slaves pray for freedom. Yeah, this house where General Lee fought his last battle. Wow, what a cool coincidence. But then we stumbled on more research that we're going to share tonight. And we've been running together ever since. Y'all probably got a good idea, but the deal is this. There's something going on right now. Yeah, come on. God is provoking the sons and daughters of Asbury and wow. Hoosier right now. Wow. And he's asking us, do we want to just let the mantle for revival drift on or will we seize it in our day and our time? Can I tell you a counter that I had? on extended fast the 33rd day of the fast I had smoke go into my lungs like from the chimney from our fireplace and it burned my lungs and uh, I got angry because you know the fire department came to our house about two months ago a false alarm my, my boys left the left the, the shower on and the heat and you know set off the steam set off the fire alarm they were nice the fire department was like, but they're like, we're going to find you next time. Smoke is going to my lungs. I'm thinking, oh, I'm thinking about my money. <laughs> I tell my wife, hey, at least close the flute on the fireplace. Matter of fact, why do you have the fireplace on right now? It's too hot. She said, there's no wood in the house and there's no fire in the fireplace. I said, well, you're on the phone again talking and you forgot you have something on the stove. You're about to burn the house down. She said, there's nothing on the stove. Your attitude sucks. <laughs> Repent. 
I said, well, I'm coughing over here. I'm coughing smoke. Check the iron, the iron is off. I go get in the car and all of a sudden I start smelling smoke again. I'm coughing again. And I thought maybe there was something wrong with the car. I called my wife and she said, Mr. Ford, what if you're on fire? And as soon as she said that, I heard the Lord say this, I'm looking for a living sacrifice. The deal is this, everybody wants revival fire, but God is asking, who's willing to be revival fuel? Yep. If that's y'all right now, will you come yep. forward? Can we pray into that right now? So Father, right now, God, we come before you. And we thank you for what you're doing in Wilmer. But God, remember Beaumont. We thank you for what you did in the first great awakening. But God, remember Beaumont. Remember one city. Remember this church. God, we're asking you for this city, in this time, in this hour, God, show us your glory. God, we ask you for your outpouring in this hour. Come, come on, y'all, you cry out for it. You own this thing. We just sense something of the tangible presence of the Lord wanting to increase more and more through this house. Matt and I are so, we're canned, we're professional. We say the same thing, always the same way in every place. This is the first time he and I both have gone off script. Something's up. Something's up. Over the fell shawls, God has not forgotten about your labor of love in Brownsville. There's another move coming through this church again. Something for Gen Z, something for millennials. God's turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children to the fathers to break the power of the curse of depression over the generation, to break the power of the pandemic off of the generation, to break the power of quarantines off a of generation, to a generation struggling with isolation and loneliness and suicide and connecting with people and relational issues. God is pouring out his spirit like a father. He's turning the hearts of fathers back to children. He's healing all of our divides in this hour, whether it's generational, whether it's ra racial, whatever, whatever it looks like. God, we thank you for walls falling in this hour in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that this would be the moment that the prodigals come home. Yes. God, right now, we cry out for the prodigals God sons and daughters right now God when you're coming to the young people don't skip our own families God bring home the prodigals God we cry out right now you know you know who they are in your own life begin just lift speak their names right now begin to lift them up right now God we call home the sons the daughters that didn't they made mistakes they didn't walk as they should but God, you're the God who forgives the mistakes and you heal families. God, bring home prodigals yes. and connect them to our unfinished business. Yes. God, God, I pray that the prodigals that were written off would now become the great deliverers of the promises that you gave us now in Jesus' name. So we break off every word curse. Yes. Everything spoken out of faith over our sons and daughters. We break that off of them right now. And we say, come, 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 taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Can, can we just take two minutes? Lift your voices right now. Whether you're praying, anything we've shared this morning, just lift your voice. Make your voice heard right now before the throne. Cry out. Cry 
Son of David, don't pass us by. He turns to you right now. He says, what do you want? Oh, son of David, don't pass us by. 